Canada here, and today I would like to talk about trains. Like most poorly adjusted people on the internet, I quite like trains, and I like to daydream about the kind of infrastructure that trains could enable, and kind of journeys that could enable, and kind of improvements for the world that could enable. So I thought I'd go and try and find somewhere to, you know, read what other people's daydreams are, see what they want to do, see if they have anything in common. So I went over to rail forums, and it turns out that uh, rail forums is not full of my kind of people. So here I am on YouTube instead. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is a transatlantic tunnel. No, not the 1935 movie, but instead the idea that you can whack a nice fast train between London and New York. And, you know, Europe, America, both quite flight heavy places. They like flying to and from each other. So, you know, you could shift a lot of those people into a tunnel, save a lot of emissions, uh, possibly do something about climate change. Maybe. But then I thought, hmm, Canada, you're nominally a scientist of some kind. You should probably actually have some data behind this, see if it's actually a reasonable idea. So I went to Wikipedia's list of the top 10 and then top however many most trafficked air routes. And what I found there surprised me. So I'm looking here at pre-COVID data because COVID messed up the numbers and they haven't quite got back to the point yet where they are meaningful to look at in our long-term post-COVID in inverted commas future. But yeah, Australia has one of the top 10 most trafficked air routes. South and West Asia, who are grouped together for reasons, uh, have two. But by far dominating this list of the top 10 is East and Southeast Asia, with seven of the top 10 most trafficked air routes. So, okay, maybe that's just an artifact of the top 10. What happens if you expand this out to the top, you know, 56 or so? 57. So four more of those are in South and West Asia, okay. Seven are now in North America. You'll notice we have none in North America in the top 10, even though you think of the United States as being particularly plane focused. You get two more in Australia. You get South America appearing with three. Africa has one of the world's top 57 traffic air routes. Then one more intercontinental. That is between uh, India and the United Kingdom. So the only place Europe appears on this list is as an intercontinental destination. And you'll see there's no flights here at all between Europe and America. So the intuition that, oh yeah, surely you'll displace a lot of flights if you connect Europe and America via rail, probably not true. At least probably not as effective as it could be. So then dominating the list with 29 of the next 47 and 36, more than half of the top 57 trafficked air routes is East and Southeast Asia. So let's look at that in a bit more detail with a map. So here is a map of East Asia. And if I scroll down, there is some Southeast Asia here as well. And to start off with, let's see what we already have in this area in terms of rail. You can see that we already have some high-speed rail under construction or already built in East Asia. And if we add to this what we have in China, you can see they have 10 times as much as everyone else. So I figured it worth giving its own layer. And you can see in Southeast Asia, we have a certain amount that's either under construction or is planned and looks like it might be built. So your dark green dashed lines are stuff that's either built or is probably going to be built soon. And uh, then the lighter green that you almost can't see is stuff that maybe one day they're talking about it on again, off again kind of thing. So let's add to that our top 10 flight routes. So you can see three in Japan, one in China, one in Korea, one in Vietnam and one in Indonesia. And then let's add 11 to 50 as well. Again, a whole bunch in China now. A few more in between countries, whereas everything, um, the top 10 are all internal flights. And then some more down in Southeast Asia. Okay. So you can see there's a whole bunch of places here that are fully connected via high-speed rail and people are still flying. Tokyo to Fukuoka, for instance, that's had high-speed rail for donkey's years at this point. People are still taking planes. 
Tokyo to Sapporo is not quite finished by Shinkansen yet. So you can get as far as Hokkaido, but you can't get all the way around to Sapporo. Even so, when it's finished, it's going to be sufficiently many hours that people will still fly instead. People I've spoken to have said as much. So what do we need instead? Well, what they're doing in Japan, and to a lesser extent, in a tiny corner of China, is building maglev. So this is not finished yet. This is the Chuo Shinkansen that's going to go from Tokyo, um, hopefully later this decade finished as far as Nagoya, and then finished to Osaka, uh, maybe a decade later. And once that's built, that's going to be sub two hours, city centre to city centre. That's going to blow air traffic out of the water. The only reason then people might want to keep using flights is if they land in Narita airport and need a connecting flight because yeah, getting from Narita into central Tokyo would add an hour onto their trip, which maybe you don't want to do. But apart from that, this should significantly knock down the number of flights on that route. So all we need to do is roll out that across East and Southeast Asia. That's simple, right? Sure, no country is going to do it by themselves. So the world just needs to come together as a dictator or otherwise and say, we are going to build a few thousand kilometres of high-speed maglev rail. I mean, the alternative is that we bake ourselves to death in aircraft fuel, so... So the daydream I have now is building a maglev network for East and Southeast Asia. And now I'm going to take you through it. So, let's start off in Japan, because Japan is where I know best. First up, I realise that the high-speed rail, the Shinkansen here, isn't finished yet. Nonetheless, it's getting maglev. You can see I've taken a slightly different route to the existing um, Tohoku Shinkansen. So a couple of reasons for that. One is so that you can pick up traffic from Narita Airport here, have three running onto the Chuo Shinkansen, which means then there'll be no excuse. There's no way people are going to keep flying this route then. Uh, the other one is you'll have a bit more development on the, the west here, you know, get more support from locals to currently don't have a Shinkansen connection or only have a mini Shinkansen connection to support getting a full, fully connected high-speed connection north and south. Staying in Japan, we need to be able to go to Fukuoka as well. You can't expect people to go from Tokyo to Osaka and then change for the um, the San Yoshin Kansen. No, they want to get through running and they want to get there fast. And again, I've taken it through Shikoku instead because Shikoku doesn't currently have any Shinkansen at all, so hopefully they'll be more supportive of getting connected. Massive boost to their economy. What else? Well, currently the number one flight route in the world by passenger numbers is Seoul to Jeju. That needs to be a faster connection. There has already been talk of extending the KTX to go into a tunnel. The government of Jeju has apparently opposed that for ruining the island's character. Like, oh, it's going to be like it's connected to the mainland, so it won't feel like an island anymore. So the alternative is that you're and underwater so you don't feel like an island anymore because there's no land left so take your choice and you can see the ktx has also had a high-speed connection to busan from seoul for a while people are not using it because they're flying instead so we need more capacity we need more speed build a maglev there so you can see there's a whole bunch of routes in china so let's consolidate these a little bit so there's three routes that go to the what I'm going to call the Greater Shenzhen area. So let's replace that by one from Shanghai. Then there's another three that come from Beijing. So let's have that as well. And the passenger numbers there are such that they would be in the top 10 if you consolidated those all into one airport. So let's see what we can do in China. There's two obvious ones. First is to connect Beijing to Shanghai. And then second is to connect Shanghai to Shenzhen and that area. And once you've done that, in principle, if you want to go from Beijing to Shenzhen, you just get a three train that goes all the way. So this third bit bright red route is also covered. What's next? Going further south, you can see that in Taiwan they are building high-speed rail, but it seems to be completely divorced from where people are travelling by plane. So let's put some maglev there as well. Then you can see in Vietnam, they are currently building high-speed rail, but I suspect that's going to be too long for people to want to take for that full distance. And I suspect it might also be not price competitive with flying. So those two things combined means I think you're not going to displace many people off planes. On the other hand, 
if it becomes more speed competitive and if the capacity is such that you can reduce the prices, then hopefully building that will displace people from planes for both of those two routes there. And then finally, for phase one, Indonesia, there's no excuse. I know that high-speed rail has been contentious in Indonesia, but there is no excuse for having an internal flight that is so heavily trafficked on, a, on an island. It just needs to be maglev already. So that is phase one. There's a few more steps that I've put into what I've called phase 1A. So step one, build that, see how the passenger numbers are. So there's a couple of tweaks that you can make. Firstly, is to keep an eye on the construction here. I know, again, this is a contentious line because uh, people in Singapore and people in Kuala Lumpur aren't sure about whether they want people coming to and from each other, but yeah, there's enough people flying that there needs to be a connection. So if this high-speed rail doesn't get built, then we need to even actually go in and build some maglev. The other two are further north. So first up, you can see there are three big airports, three big cities here. You've got Guangzhou, you've got Shenzhen, you've got Hong Kong. Currently, those are served by one terminus with local connections between them. If people don't want that because it's not fast enough, then we need to build a connection there. And then also you can see between Jeju and Busan, currently there's a flight. People might be willing to travel up and then travel back down again. But if not, then you can build another connection there. So let's just go through now and tidy up everything where we think we're going to get modal shift, we're going to displace people from planes. So this guy, this guy, this guy should all be covered by the blue line there. Then Tokyo Fukuoka, Tokyo Sapporo, and Busan Jeju. And then further south, we are going to claim that this will also satisfy demand for Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City and Jakarta to Denpasar. And then going back through the next 47, then we're ready to continue. So we've got rid of almost all of the top 10 flights and a whole bunch of the next 46. So what does that lead us to phase two? So phase two has got two projects involving undersea tunnels that didn't seem practical for phase one. First up, you can see people want to travel from Japan to Korea. They should be able to. So let's connect Fukuoka to Busan by Maglev so people can just get a three train from Osaka through Fukuoka up to Busan and then up to Seoul if they want to. And then secondly, there's an internal connection here in Indonesia that has a very small undersea stretch but mostly is on land. It's not very densely populated so it doesn't seem to make that much sense of phase one but by the time we get to phase two we need to have a rail connection here as well. So that will get rid of that flight. And then up here, we can get rid of that flight. Okay, progress. So phase three, we really need to improve connectivity here. We've got a whole bunch of disconnected individual lines. We want to start making them into a network. First up, people want to travel from Jakarta, both to Singapore and to Kuala Lumpur. And those two lines actually already go very close to each other. So let's join those up. Tiny little undersea line there. Easy peasy. Next up, you can see if we look at the Philippines here, this is not going to be easy construction, but it's got to happen. There's no way around it. I think it's going to make more sense to go slightly long way around because that's where population centres are, and because I think the undersea geographies are slightly more amenable to tunnelling there. But either way, we need that connection. And then finally, for phase three, one more connection up here. I don't think phase three is the right time to make the link all the way up to China. So I'm going to suggest we do Bangkok to Vin, just to, well, firstly get some rail investment in an area that's had very, very little over the last century. And then also to connect these two networks so that we're ready in phase four to join up that gap. So again, let's hide Jakarta to Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta to Singapore, and Manila to Chibi. I do apologise if I'm pronouncing anywhere wrong because I have no idea. So that was phase three. Phase four is where we get really ambitious. So first up for phase four, we've got to do something about this bright red line. And we've hopefully by this point developed enough expertise in undersea tunnelling that it's not too implausible to do a tunnel from Fukuoka down to Naha 
So then you can get a single train from Tokyo all the way down to Naha. Don't have to fly. Arrive in Okinawa, refreshed. I don't know if that's quite the length that it would make sense to have a maglev sleeper train, but there needs to be connectivity there, and it can't be by plane. What next, in terms of massive ambition? Well, let's say it's probably going to be a while before we can build three phases of multiple thousands of kilometres of high-speed maglev going across national borders and in tunnels. So possibly by that time, the government in Beijing and the government in Taipei will have become happy enough with each other that they would be willing to allow a rail connection between their respectively controlled territories. And we can put in a line under the sea from Taipei to Fujian, which will then allow connections from Taipei down to Hong Kong, which is again one of the top 50 routes in the world by traffic at the moment. What else do we need? You can see people want to go from southern China down to Southeast Asia. We need to make that connection. Let's do that as well. And then they also want to go further south than Phuket, so they will also need a connection down to be able to go down to Singapore. I put this junction here rather than coming out of Phuket with a reversal, just because the geography of the area to the east of Phuket makes that look a little bit easier. But again, I'm not a railway planner. I'm just drawing with crayons on a map. So let's tidy up again where we've displaced some more flights. Hong Kong to Singapore. All importantly, Tokyo to Naha. Hong Kong to Bangkok and Hong Kong to Taipei. And there, that's looking much healthier. But you can see there's still a few points left that tentatively we can put into phase five. Phase five is the, is this necessary? Maybe not. Is this ambitious? Definitely yes. The first is we have two isolated networks here at the moment. We've got Japan and Korea, and then we've got China and points south. People do want to go at least from Seoul into China. So there's a couple of routes that we could take. So assuming that we were able to build a connection from Taipei to Pichian during phase four, then one way they could go is to go south through Fukuoka, through Naha, and then via Taipei, if we build that undersea connection. Not trivial. Geography is not our friend there, but it looks on a very casual inspection or some ocean depth maps that that might be possible. And then the alternative is that we go north, so assuming that the governments of North and South Korea have somehow made friends, not impossible if the previously mentioned governments make, make friends, and maybe North and South Korea make friends as well, then you could take the north route and go much more directly, Beijing to Seoul, and then down to China. Probably in terms of physical geography, a lot easier to build. In terms of human geography, possibly not. So other things, you can see we've still got a West China route that is not currently being served by our maglev network. It would be nice if people didn't have to fly to get to Chengdu. So more maglev. Get this big junction down south here. So that is not doing badly. There is one more point in Indonesia that currently there is an internal flight. Ideally we'd like to avoid an internal flight if we could. There's not very many good routes to get across this gap. This is getting into some very deep ocean there, but it's not completely impossible that this route could work with tunneling. Again, I am not a railway infrastructure engineer. I am just drawing lines on a map, so obviously I can make it sound as easy as I want, but there we go. So tidying up those, we can get rid of that. Result to Hong Kong, Beijing to Chengdu, and so to Chengdu. So there's only one route left at this point that's currently air, that's Hong Kong to Manila. I don't see an obvious way of maglefting that. I realise it's disappointing after we've just maglefed every single other air connection on this map, but yeah, there's really no obvious routes there. Maybe you could go down through Taiwan and across that gap, but I suspect the infrastructure costs in terms of carbon emissions of that are going to be higher than the returns you'll get even with that amount of air traffic. So. I'm going to say that's as far as you'll get there. But potentially one more thing worth looking at is could you then make a connection up through Hokkaido and then up towards North America if you wanted to continue onwards towards Alaska, Canada, down into the USA. If you wanted to avoid trans-Pacific flights, that's probably going to be the easiest way because, again, sea does look sufficiently shallow there that you might be able to tunnel rather than actually having to have a uh, tunnel through open ocean, which much harder. So, 
that is it. That is my maglev crayons for Southeast Asia. You see, I have done it for Southeast Asia, firstly because the network's really fun, but that is then because there are so many flights there. There are so many heavily trafficked air routes that if you look at the same map in other countries or other regions of the world, it's just you stick one line in, or you stick two lines in, and you're done. This interesting networking effect. Really, really fun to draw. So, yeah. Well, I had plans to end the video there, but in the weeks of procrastinating before editing this video, I came across Rail Matter and watched a bunch of it and came across the Rail Matter Rules for Crayonistas, and I thought it would be remiss of me looking through these as applied to this giant project. So, first off, think about what it's for. So, what is it for? Well, it's to turn this mess of flights into this beautiful set of maglev lines but to drive people away from flying, reduce the number of flights, reduce carbon emissions, also connect up people on route who wouldn't have access to those flights and yeah to take 20 something of the top 50 something flights routes in the world and get everyone from them onto trains instead. Okay done. Let's think about what it's for again. So let's look at some details of this. So we look here we see now people in southern Japan can far more easily get across to Korea. That's a very popular route. People want to be able to do that. Now they can do it by rail in a more environmentally friendly way, but also connect to communities along the way. So people in Chicago can more easily get to Tokyo, can more easily get to South Korea and places further afield as well. I used to work with someone who had parents in Hokkaido, but was working in Nagoya. If they wanted to go home to visit their parents, they would have to fly because getting the Shinkansen to Tokyo and then up to Aomori and as it was at the time the slow train across into Hokkaido was just too impractical. Even with the Chuo Shinkansen and the Hokkaido Shinkansen that's still going to be too slow for most people when you can get a very short flight from Nagoya up there. So it will allow those intermediary journeys as well. And then looking further south we're looking at regions that are very car reliant and trying to transition those to being able to use more sustainable, more efficient forms of transportation. So not only the flights, but also local journeys within Thailand. A lot of people drive in Thailand, a lot of people fly from north to south Thailand as well. So being able to do those trips by rail and in an expedient way by rail seems to make a lot of sense. Okay, so don't just reuse old alignments. I don't think we've even looked at a close enough level of detail to see where the old alignments are. So we're not reopening old railways. There are some cases where there are existing rail corridors it makes sense to follow, like in China and Vietnam, where we're following the likely route of the Tantai speed line. But we're not just reopening old railways for the fun of it. It's actually taking a more holistic look about where there is demand. I don't just bulldoze everything. Again, we haven't really looked in enough detail to see what needs to be bulldozed, but I think a lot of this would need to be in tunnel in the same way that the Chuo Shinkansen is being built. And yeah, that has very little bulldozing going on. They are integrating into existing stations and they are trying to do that in as non-destructive a way as they can. Uh, mimic real railway geometry. As I've said, I am not any kind of railway engineer. I'm just a person here with some crayons. Uh, so I don't know how well I've mimicked that. I've tried in places. I've tried not to have too many sharp corners, but again, we're at a very, very zoomed out level, so it's hard to see what those look like. Snap a ghost on it. Use big numbers. Okay, let's come back to that. Uh, don't do anything fancy. Well, you could see a very large maglev project spanning an entire continent being relatively fancy, but it is mostly proven technology. It is stuff that is already being built for the true ocean Canton, just scaled up. Uh, compare that with the transatlantic tunnel that is either putting a tunnel through the sea, actually through the water of the ocean, which has never been done before, or you're trying to dig tunnels through magma, actually through an active volcano, which is again something that is completely unproven, completely high in the sky. So in that sense, this project is relatively grounded, the sea and ocean routes that it takes hug land where possible, and we'll see in a moment that we don't have any absurdly long stretches of undersea tunnel, especially in the early stages. So, so let's come back to these costings now. So we need to break it down by phase, and then with each phase, what I've done is I've taken the 2021 cost estimate of the Chuo Shinkansen. You might say that's not realistic, but it's the closest thing we've got, and 
you might get some economies of scale, but you probably also get some effects from the fact that you're massively increasing demand on a bunch of stuff that is needed for it. So probably the right ballpark at least. I've also doubled that for any underwater segments and put together a rough spreadsheet of distances, something like that, and then summarized that in a table, which then I can summarize into a slightly nicer table. So I've broken this down by length of track you've got on land, length you've got underwater, and then also highlighting that longest underwater segment. So trying to make that scale, so starting off with tunnels that we now had to build now, and then as we develop more expertise, later phases can have longer tunnels up to phase five with the somewhat ambitious 270 kilometer underwater tunnel. And then cost in 2021 US dollars, again based on the Chihuahua and Kansan cost, starting off at two and a bit trillion dollars for phase one, Phase 1a is almost free in those metrics. And then total cost of almost 7 trillion US dollars, which is, it's a lot of money. It's also in the same ballpark as estimates for a transatlantic tunnel. That's 1 to 20 trillion dollars is the latest estimate I've seen for that. So on the scale of things that governments spend money on, for any one government it is very big. For governments of the entire world pooling together to try and reduce the potential for climate change, then it's yeah, it's it's big, but it's conceivable potentially. Certainly, if you're thinking about a transatlantic tunnel, then you should also be thinking about this because you're going to get a lot more out of it for a similar ballpark of money. So yeah, slap the cost on it. So five out of seven points checked, probably. Yeah, that's that's all you're getting. Please don't subscribe because you're never getting another video like this from me again.